final video of lecture four, we will talk about one of the latest methods in the causal inference arsenal, which is the regression kink design. You can see from the name that it sounds very similar to the regression discontinuity design. And you will also see that it works in a very similar way. And a regression discontinuity design what we exploit is an actual discontinuity. So we have a discontinuity in the running variable x and we then want to see whether the outcome changes discontinuously at that discontinuity. In a regression kink design, we do not have an, a discontinuous jump of the outcome and also not a discontinuous jump, importantly, of the, the treatment assignment. But what we have is a kink in the assignment function of treatment. So what this would look like is something like that, where you have the discontinuity x naught, and then you have, let's say, so let this be the probability of getting treated uh, for, for a given level of x. You have something like that. You have a, a function below, and then that, that function has a kink at the discontinuity. So that the, the probability of getting treated jumps at that discontinuity, but, but not exactly. It's just that the, the, for an increase in x, the likelihood of getting, getting treated increases so it's basically not a, a change in it's not a discontinuous jump but it's a change in the first derivative of the the assignment function of the assignment function of treatment and this can also be used for causal identification now obviously this is something that is a little bit more tricky not so much from an analytical perspective um so getting to uh, you know, getting to derive the, 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 the treatment effects that you can estimate with that is actually not that hard. What is hard, however, is that you need obviously a lot more data points to, de to detect a difference in the first derivative rather than an actual discontinuous jump. So this is a technique for which you typically need large administrative data sets. That's what it's typically used for. So here is an example of a regression kink design. And, and this is purely now the, the first stage or the, the assignment function. So these, these are subsidies. So the authors here look at subsidies for medication. So what happens here is, I think this is a study from Denmark, I believe, is that if the cost of your medication is below 500, the assignment rule of the, or the, the subsidy rule is the one that is to the left of the threshold. Okay, so so it's, it's uh, you have to, pay if, if it's 450 you pay have to pay about 65 percent of your medication yourself and that the um, the fraction you have to pay yourself decreases linearly until the total cost is 500 and if it's anywhere above 500 it remains at a level of 48 percent or something like that right so you have this kink in the assignment function Right, so, so here uh, to the left, you have a situation where you pay more than 48% or whatever that cap is. And to the right, you pay 48% of the total cost. Here is another example. That's from a, a paper from, from Camille Londay, who looked at uh, unemployment benefits in, in Louisiana. And then looked at the effect of the generosity of, of unemployment benefits on job search outcomes and then on re-employment outcomes as well. And what happens in Louisiana is that 
as in many other places, the amount you get, the, the benefit amount, depends on your previous earnings, but is capped. And this is typically what, uh, what happens or, or when you can apply a regression discontinuity design, when you have uh, benefits that, are, that depend on some value, but are capped and you get a lot, you have a lot of such, uh, such policies in place when it comes to unemployment benefits, child benefits, contributions to uh, medical expenses, all sorts of subsidies, many of them follow such rules. So in Louisiana, what happened was that your, your benefit amount, your weekly benefit amount depends on the highest quarterly earnings in a given period before you became unemployed. And so there is a linear, a linearly increasing part to that schedule. So the more you earned, the more you, you actually get in terms of benefits, but then there was a cap at some point at, uh, so, so no matter if you, if your earnings exceeded uh, I don't know what that is. That point is probably three and a half thousand dollars a month. Then if, if they exceed that, your weekly benefit amount will stay at $140. And that cap was gradually increased. And that's something that, that he then also exploits. But what we basically want to study in an RD, uh, in, an, in a regression kink design is we want to know if we see a kink in the assignment function, do we also see a kink in the outcome? And can we then relate the two? Okay, so, so obviously people who are uh, somewhere around here, they receive a lower benefit amount than people who are above that, that threshold. And uh, again, we can assume that the two of them, the two groups, when we get close to the threshold are pretty much the same. And it's as good as randomly assigned, whether you're above or below. Whether that's true depends on the context, obviously. Depends on how much people can manipulate their, uh, their taxable income. Um, but that, that's, that's what we basically do. So, so we wanna get at the treatment effect of receiving higher benefits um, by comparing people who are just above and just below that, that, that kink point here. And uh, so, so the way we can do this is we can simply look at the reduced form and see, well, is there a noticeable kink point? And in that case, this seems to be the case. So this is a classic uh, question in, in labor economics, whether the amount that the duration of unemployment is related to the benefit generosity. And, uh, and so you can see here a very clear kink point at, uh, in, in the outcome that as the benefit levels increase, the, the duration of unemployment also decreases, but then it decreases as we as it exceeds that, that, that kink point. One would have to think about a behavioral model that explains why this is the case. Um, that whatever is below the kink point, so between point four and one, is, is I believe, easy to explain, right? So, so, so the, the higher your, your benefit payment is, the, the lower is the, the opportunity cost of, of, of searching, sorry, the, the higher is the opportunity cost of searching or the, the, you know, the more you can afford basically to, to search for a longer time. Whereas if the benefits are very, very low, then um, being unemployed is, is very, very costly. So, so basically the, the higher the, um, the, the benefits, the, the lower are the opportunity costs of being unemployed. Um, Above the threshold, you, you'd have to think why this is downward sloping and why it's not just, just horizontal. That depends on, on people's preferences and, and, and people's constraints. Now, how to estimate this in, uh, in practice? Uh, what's behind this? Um, and this, this comes from the, 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 the first paper that, that introduced this technique 
um, was uh, carved at all in, in 2015 in the Econometrica paper. So the main contribution of that paper was to, to formalize that methodology. Um, there was applications exploiting these kinks before that, but, but they were the first to really formalize that. And so the idea here is that you have a, uh, an assignment function V and uh, what you have is that you have a deterministic function of V that has a kink at that, that discontinuity. Right? So, so in the regression discontinuity design, we had uh, we had simply a dummy whether whether that assignment function was below or above the threshold. Here we can't include that, but we have to basically include a function that has a kink. That that's what B is, and the rest is then a simple walled estimator. It tells us to what extent the outcome changes at the kink point relative to the likelihood of getting treated changes. So it's a wild estimator as we had it with the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So again, the identification assumptions are similar to the regression discontinuity design. The only difference is that we no longer have a jump, but we have just a, a, a kink in the assignment function. So the idea is again that units above and below the kink are similar and the assignment, to whether you're above or below the threshold or in that case, the kink point is as good as random. And then you have the, the, the standard identification assumptions, which is that the density is, of the assignment variable is smooth at the kink point, which means basically there is no manipulation. If there was manipulation, if it's way more beneficial for people to be above that king point, then you should maybe see some, some bunching of observations that are just above the king point. And you have to have it that, and this is new, that the treatment assignment rule is continuous at the king point. So it has a king point, but it doesn't have a jump. And so so if, you, if you approach the, what, what continuity here means is that if you approach the king point, from, from either side, you arrive at the same value. So what it means is that you have, uh, if, if this is the, if this is the, um, the, the, the threshold, if you approach the threshold from the left, uh, or if you approach the threshold from the right, you arrive here at the same level, why not? Um, um, as opposed to, so, so that assumption would not be fulfilled if you are in regression discontinuity land where you have at the threshold, you could have the same functional, uh, same first different, sorry, the same first derivative as in the picture above, but you have this, this, this very clear jump. So if you approach that threshold from the right and you approach it from the left, you arrive at different values of the outcome. That would be there that continuity condition, which is the second identification assumption will be violated. If you have that in your study, well, you can't do a regression kink design. You can't say, oh, look at my fancy RKD, but yeah, you can consider yourself lucky because um, typically, it's much easier to carry out a regression discontinuity design because simply there is this more noticeable jump and it's way easier to, de to detect a jump than to detect a change in the first derivative. Do units need to comply perfectly with the assignment rule? Of course not. We can then also have a fuzzy regression kink design. Now you can see here that this technique, you know, the, 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 the methods paper that introduced this only came out a couple of years ago. This is way newer. So there is a lot more things that we don't know yet about inference and so on, and that are only coming out now and about, you know, what is the right uh, polynomial to impose above and below the king point and so on. So this is all just, this is a method that is, that is, 
you know, constantly developing. Um, some people say that, you know, the, the, the regression discontinuity was a field for statistics nerds who could do all sorts of fancy non-parametric things and finally put them to good use so that everyone could apply them. Um, but then once everything there has been, everything that we wanted to know has been shown, they needed a new topic to move on to. And then regression kink design is obviously this, this topic, whether that's true or not. I leave that up to you to, 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 to think about that. Um, okay. So, so these are the, 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 the conditions. Now, how do you do this in reality? Again, people typically look at the reduced form. So you just have a linear regression uh, above and below the, um, the, the threshold, or you simply impose a different slope above and below the threshold. So that's exactly what's getting done here is, is just that you have basically a piecewise linear regression um, where you have the threshold here, and then you have a function here. Um, and then above the kink point, you have a, a function like that. And so if we, so the parameter that, that we're estimating here is simply, um, this, uh, if, if we had a, if, if we include a parameter here, which is this, this, this V or it's, it's a Greek letter that I, whose name I don't know now, but that if, if it's linear, then VP is exactly the difference between those two slopes. And that, that would be the, the case here. Um, but obviously uh, that would be for P to the power of one. You can also think about, uh, about higher order polynomials here. Right. Um, you can obviously also do this as a fuzzy regression uh, kink design where you also have to model the first stage. And the way this is typically done is you estimate separately the first stage and separately the reduced form and then put the two things together in a walled estimate. The tricky thing is you can't really do this in a regression framework, all the things together. So you need to determine your standard errors via bootstrap. And that when you, you know, remember that you can only do a fuzzy regression kink design or any regression kink design when you have lots of observations, then doing, you know, standard errors with 10,000 bootstrap replications computationally is a bit difficult. So it's not impossible, but it's just computationally a little bit more challenging. Um, now there are lots of refinements by the group of uh, researchers uh, who I mentioned, you know, there's lots of ideas now about optimal bandwidth and, and uh, what parametric and non-parametric methods you can use. So if you want to use this method, which I encourage, if you have the data and if you, if you have a policy setting where that fits, you have to see what the latest refinements are. Now, finally, let me just walk you through the example that was given by, uh, the, uh, by the paper in, uh, of, of CART and, and co-authors. So they looked at uh, unemployment benefits in Austria. So, so this is a similar setting to, uh, to the one that Landé looked at in Louisiana, where again, you have a cap in the amount of benefits. So your benefits depend on the earnings before you became unemployed. Um, and so the unemployment benefits will be 55% of your net daily earnings, but up to a cap. Okay, so, so, so uh, at some point, the, uh, that percentage that, that your unemployment uh, percentage of income that is replaced by your unemployment benefits goes down after the cap. Okay. Because if you earn, I don't know, a hundred thousand euro, you will still only receive the amount of unemployment benefits that is at the cap. And so in the data, you can, can uh, clearly see now this, this is, this is not the, the you know, the, the, the legal schedule. This is actually plotting out what the average daily unemployment benefits are in a bin scatter of people whose income is at, at these different levels. And you can see 
that it holds up pretty well. Okay, it looks very much like a, a shader with a kink point. Then what they do is they they see in the data, again, this is a bin scatter. They see whether there is any bunching at that king point. Okay? Because if it's more beneficial to be above the king point, then we should see bunching there. Um, we don't see that. And that's that's good. So that that's that's very useful for us. And then this is the, the reduced form. And that tells a very good story. Because it tells you that. Yes, there is a relationship between the earnings replacement or be between, let's say, the generosity of unemployment benefits and the duration of unemployment. And it tells us also something about the behavior of job seekers, that if we look at those people who are at the right of the discontinuity, those people here, where the unemployment benefit doesn't increase with prior income, right? They, they, they don't get a more generous unemployment benefits. Their search behavior must be the same or must be very similar. Okay? Whether I compare someone here, whether I take someone here or someone there, they get the same unemployment benefits. And also we see the same average duration of unemployment. Whereas here we see a very clear difference between people down here who receive a low benefit and people here who receive a high benefit. And that, that clearly indicates that, th that there is a, a significant relationship between the unemployment benefit generosity and the duration of unemployment. So that's something that, uh, you know, that, that teaches us a lot about job search, uh, job search behavior and potentially also about the optimal design of unemployment benefit. Now, I wanted to also show you this graph here, which, is, is a which has become a standard graph to show in regression discontinuity and kink design papers. What you do here is you show the estimates and 95% confidence intervals for different bandwidths. And you can see here that obviously, if you have a very narrow bandwidth, you have very few observations based on which you estimate. And in this case, you estimate the size of a kink point. So obviously, um, this is then statistically insignificant. So the confidence intervals include uh, zero. But, uh, but if you make the bandwidth wider, um, the, the, the confidence bands become narrower and, and, and you get you have more precision and, and you see here that the results are then significant at a 95% level once your, your bandwidth uh, exceeds that threshold. Right? But what, what that graph shows you is that the results are fairly similar no matter what the bandwidth is. And that's what you want. And you can see that they're not exactly the same. So if you, if you look at it, um, you know, if I start with a line at the results with a narrow bandwidth, you can see that the results decrease. Right? The, the line isn't exactly straight now, but they do decrease, believe me. Um, and that can be due to, uh, to points that are very far away from the threshold that get a, a high weight. Okay? But if I go narrower, the, the effect that I estimate seems to be bigger. Right? But, but that, that's an important graph that you, that you want to show. Now, one thing that, that is tricky with regression discontinuity and particularly with regression kink design is, is the statistical inference. Because you, you only have people above and below the, 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 the threshold and you look at data points within a very narrow interval. And so you obviously you have this problem of overfitting. So the standard errors that you have there for that, that jump for that treatment effect or for the Wald estimator when you look at the, um, when you have a regression kink design, those standard errors only reflect the sampling uncertainty, but they do not reflect 
the model uncertainty, which comes from the fact that, that you don't know what the right functional form is and you just impose one, but that may not be the right one. And so uh, Ganong and, and, and Jaeger have a paper where they, they propose a permutation test whereby you pretend that the, the king point is somewhere different, very far away from the bandwidth, and then try, what they do is they basically estimate the, the effects at different placebo king points far away from the actual one. And then sometimes you will still get significant results, but you get a distribution of, out, of, of, of estimates and that distribution of estimates can then be used to compute the standard errors, right? Because uh, at those points, at those placebo points, there is no actual king point. Um, yet we get results that are consistent with a, with, a, with a king point. And what we do then is we compare our results at the actual king point to those placebo king points. And when our result is very different from the distribution of placebo king points, where there was actually none, um, then that indicates that it's a true effect, okay? that, that it represents the true effect. So to conclude, regression kink design is a new method that is similar to regression discontinuity, but has this, but with the difference that we no longer have a jump in the treatment of Simon function, but we have a change in the first derivative. And that can be used, and it's actually quite straightforward to implement. Also, what it allows us to do is if we combine this with a, a micro theoretical model that, that models the, the, the choice of people under different regimes, we can actually use this method to back out behavioral elasticities. Okay, so, so what is, for example, the, the uh, elasticity of, uh, of job search behavior or job search effort uh, for different uh, benefit levels, that's something we can possibly back out with a regression king design. And that's what makes it quite attractive. The challenge with this is that you need very, very detailed data and that you oftentimes just don't have. But if you have it, by all means, go and go and do it. And, and as there are more and more data sets, administrative data sets out there, we should also be able to get more such, uh, we, we, we will be see, seeing, and you should also be able to apply more regression kink designs.